So today's focus is talking about web authentication, web authn, and does it really signal the end of passwords for browsers? Now, before we jump into the web authentication piece and how exactly it works, let's kind of look at our favorite passwords and you know, why passwords suck, and then also why multi-factor authentication to some extent sucks. So let's, let's look at the, some of the things there. It's a safe harbor statement. So this is an email from a large financial company that recommends how do you go about securing your password? How do you create a complex password with combination of letters and numbers and symbols? And it should be different from every different online account you guys have, so it should be unique. And not only that, you have to change your passwords often. Now what is wrong with this recommendation? I mean, it seems like a pretty reasonable recommendation, right? Um, now, how, how many accounts, online accounts, do all of us have? Like hundreds, right? How are we supposed to remember unique passwords for all of them, and on top of that, change them all the time? I mean, you know, maybe every three months or every six months. Now, this is where password managers, of course, come to rescue. But how many of us are actually using the password managers? What percentage of populations using password managers? Very few. So this is one of the big challenges. So. I'm actually sending this company Twitter messages to add MFA. And then, according to NIST guidelines, companies should not put the burden of managing the password's complexity on the consumers. And they shouldn't have to have changed passwords often either. I mean, unless, you know, there's a big breach or something like that, and, you know, they need to do, go through that. Instead, the company these should take the burden of managing and securing the access for those users. How many of you guys have not showed up in this list yet? Please raise your hands. Please meet me outside. I'd love to know what you guys are doing. Because, I mean, this is like you have seven point some billion um, unique username and passwords already there. So, you know, it's like even if we have complex passwords, if somebody's database gets breached, your credentials are going to show up here. So it really doesn't matter how complex your password's going to be in that case. You're going to end up here. And then what are the consequences? The attackers or hackers can basically get to it through, um, to be able to take over your account through credential stuffing, password spraying. And then you have all the phishing type of attacks too, right, which doesn't even need this type of a database. So this is a latest breach that I picked as an example. So this is a Citrix data breach that happened, I think it was around like last month, but it happened around December. Um, and this happened because the attackers were able to gain access to the Citrix network through password spraying attack, and they were able to steal six terabytes of sensitive information. I mean, um, what are the consequences of that again? You're pretty much getting a bad brand name. Your customers lose trust. And then, of course, a huge financial impact, right? And to the users as well, now your information is out there. So what's the simplest way to mitigate these types of attacks? Well, you add multi-factor authentication. Now, what's the most commonly used MFA factors in the consumer websites? Even if you look at our financial um, websites today, right, most of them end up using SMS. But if you look from left to right, we've got security questions, SMS, OTPs, so like app-based OTPs, uh, push notifications, U2Fs, biometrics, there's all of these different types of factors. So depending on the factor types, MFA is still hackable. And let's, let's look at another example here. So I picked Citrix as an example specifically because one of the articles said that the attackers were not only able to get into the um, network through stealing the, basically the password spraying attack, but also able to bypass multi-factor authentication. Now, we don't have a lot of details on how they did that because Citrix didn't share that in their blog, but you know, depending on the factor types, like I said, MFA is still hackable. So let's look at some of the ways MFA is, can be hacked. So with SMS being the most common way to do MFA on the consumer websites, SwimSwap has been on the rise. So SwimSwap is where um, an attacker will basically poses you through social engineering, then call your telecommunications company like AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile, and then be able to kind of convince them to swap the SIM card out and take over your number altogether. So now they start getting the texts directly, and then you get disconnected from there. 
Um, Reddit actually had an attack like this on their employee accounts, and so they basically were seeing swim swap, swim, sim swap attacks. And then also you must have read the news on this Bitcoin investor who was suing, suing the AT&T for losing $23 million in just sim swap attacks. Even time-based OTPs, right, those app-based OTPs can be phished. So we talked about different types of attacks here. Um, now this is where, you know, if a user, in this case the attacker, sends a legit looking email to this user on, for Amazon shipping. So he basically gets an email, he clicks on the link, and if you notice, this is a fake website with two ends, but everything, the email looked legit, the, the, the web page looks legit, and the user does not notice the domain name there. So he happily enters his username and password. Now what's happening behind the scenes is this attacker is proxying all the requests to the real website. And this is all automated, right? There's no one sitting in the back right there. And so the credentials are then passed to the real website. The real website asks for OTP. The OT then the attacker is basically requesting the user for the OTP, and then the attacker is able to get the OTP and take over the account. So that's, that's basically taking over the TOTPs as well. And then we have these next generation types of phishing attacks with evil genics. Now this is a man in the middle attack where the, the attacker is not only able to get your username and passwords, but also be able to get, capture the session information like authentication tokens and session information stored in your cookies and completely bypass MFA except U2F. And I'll come back to that. But this is where the attacker does not even need to create a fake website. They just leverage the fake domain name. And then they, ha they basically have this man in the middle evil, evil genic server sitting in the middle. And it's basically intercepting all the information and sending that back to the real website. So from a user standpoint, they are interacting with the content on the, you re uh, the real website, but the domain name is not right. And so how do you go about, I mentioned U2F is the only one that cannot be phished. So let's look at why U2F behaves that way and how it's resistant to phishing. So before we get into the U2F, I just want to kind of talk about FIDO. So FIDO stands for Fast Identity Online. And FIDO Alliance is a um, open industry consortium that are focused, and they basically deliver simpler, stronger authentication. So public key cryptography based authentication. And they have three different protocols. They have U2F, UAF, and FIDO2. So let's look at how U2F works first. With U2F devices, they have the capability of storing uh, or generating origin-specific public-private key pair. And when I say origin-specific, it's actually the domain. It's tied to the domain. So if now in the previous attack that we looked at Amazon, it's actually when the user is registering to the real website, the public-private key pair is tied to the actual domain name there. So that's the origin-specific um, key pair. So now when the user is registering the new device, uh, the U2F device as part of the multi-factor authentication step, the U2F device sends the public key and a credential ID back to the web server, and that's basically stored on the web server side. And so when the user logs in, so that was a registration piece, right? And in this case, during the registration, the private key never left the U2F device, by the way. So when the user logs in, they enter their username and password, and then the web server sends a challenge back to the client. This challenge is a randomly generated string, long enough to not be able to be guessed. And that challenge, along with the credential ID, right, because it identifies what the credential ID for this origin is, and so it sends that, and then this client adds that origin ID and sends the challenge along with that to the U2F device. The U2F device then asks the user for the user presence, which means they have to tap on the device. It checks for the origin at this point as well. And then, it, based on the credential ID and the origin, it then signs the challenge with the private key uh, tied to that public key and sends that signed challenge back to the server. Now, any, uh, on the server side, then the server verifies um, the public key, uh, the signature, basically, the value of the challenge to make sure that there was no man in the middle there, and also the origin. Now, anywhere, if anything fails, we know that we got fished. As an example, 
When the U2F device, in the previous example where we saw Amazon had the wrong domain, if the previous example now the client sends a wrong origin information, that U2F device is going to reject that because the public-private key pair was tied to the real Amazon um, domain. So that's the FIDO2. And I talked about UAF and uh, FIDO2. Uh, sorry, that was the U2F. And then I talked about UAF and FIDO2 as well. So those are, again, very similar based on public key cryptography. UAF didn't really gain any backing, but that was their passwordless approach to the same um, authentication mechanism. But that's where we have uh, FIDO2 that came along, too. So all of, them, all of these protocols are structurally the same when it comes to using public key cryptography for uh, authentication. But there are some differences, right? So U2F does not have a concept of a user. It only ties the credentials to the origin. So that's the problem with that, which is why we can't do user verification. And so we cannot use this as a passwordless, uh, for passwordless. We have to use this only as a multi-factor authentication or a 2FA. Now, this is where FIDO2 came along. So if you look at FIDO2, this is FIDO's passwordless evolution for FIDO U2F. It's a strong, simple, unfishable standard for secure authentication. FIDO2 comprises of two big components. You have the CTAP, which is the client to authenticator protocol. And that's basically a protocol that's um, it's like a low-level protocol for communications with Bluetooth, NFC, or USB to, uh, uh, to communicate with the authenticators. Then you have the web authentication APIs. And we'll talk about that too. But that's basically the interface that ties your web application to talk to the uh, authenticators and be able to authenticate through the devices. So it's basically allowing your consumers, your users, to be able to authenticate with the devices that they own and authenticate into your web application. And then this FIDO2 server would be your web server, your web application that is FIDO2 enabled. And so let's look at each of these components. So I talked about CTAP. So that's the client to authenticator protocol. And CTAP comprises of CTAP1, which is the older one. And then you have the CTAP2, uh, which is the newer uh, protocol as well. And each of these can, um, you can basically the communication mechanisms is either through NFC, USB, um, or Bluetooth here. And when it comes to authenticators, I've been just kind of showing you guys the U2F earlier. Uh, devices, but there are different types of authenticators here. You have the platform authenticators, and then you have the roaming external authenticators. Now, platform authenticators could be, say, your MacBooks or any of the devices that have like a biometrics type of an authentication mechanism where, you, you know, when you log in, you're doing a fingerprint, um, or, you know, even on your other laptops where you do have biometrics type of a device, even for Windows Hello as an example, too. And then on your phone, you have biometrics. You have either a bi um, touch ID or a face ID. So that can act as your, as your platform authenticator. And then you have your external authenticators. Now, these are devices like, that are FIDO2 enabled. And they have a, a capability of doing beyond just what U2F was doing, right? So they can also do biometrics, or they can handle the PIN. So, and even phones can be considered as external authenticators because they can communicate with your laptop through Bluetooth in this case. And then we have the web authentication API, so web authen. So web authen APIs are basically, they allow your websites to be able to authenticate using one of the devices that I showed you that the user already has. So it's a very easy way to authenticate without remembering any passwords. It is, think of that as an interface between your authenticator and your web application. It is a public key extension to credential management API. So for those of you who are not familiar with credential management API, you know, when you log into some of the websites and your browser keeps prompting you, hey, do you want to store your password for this website? Um, that's behind the scenes using credential management API. So if you look at that, when when the browser is prompting you for, hey, do you want to store your password? It's calling a navigator.credentials.store function. And the credentials are your password, username and password. And when you want to basically log in and retrieve the credentials from the browser's credential storage, then you're calling the navigator.credentials.get. And this works for federated identities as well. 
So with WebAuthn, the methods that we're using, the functions we're using is very similar. Now, web authentication, you're actually generating a public-private keeper on the authenticator. So instead of a store, you're going to say navigator.credentials.create, and then the credentials type would be public key. And then when you're getting the credentials from the authenticator, then you're doing a navigator.credentials.get with the public key. So that's the difference. That's how it's the extension to the credential management API. So going back to web authentication, it enables strong authentication with public key cryptography. And it is supported by all the leading browsers and platforms today. And I'll show you guys a whole list of browsers that are supporting web authentication today. And it is backed by big names like Google, Microsoft, YubiKey, Yubico, uh, PayPal, Mozilla. All of them are, have, have backed WebAuthn. Oops, wrong direction. And in fact, just last month, W3C and FIDO Alliance finalized the web standard for secure passwordless authentication web, web, with WebAuthn. So now WebAuthn is a standard for passwordless authentication. Now enough about like high level, right? We want to do deep dive. But before we deep dive into how exactly it works behind the scenes, let's just look at a quick demo. All right, so let's take a look at WebAuthn in action. Uh, so I am running on a Chrome browser here, just the latest version of Chrome. And uh, basically what we've done is we've created a WebAuthn demo uh, using the Okta sign-in widget skin. So for those of you who are used to logging into Okta, uh, you'll see the same look and feel. Except one major difference. Uh, there's a username field, but there is no password. Uh, so that's the whole purpose of our talk today, eliminate those passwords. So I'm going to, as a user, sign up for an account. And again, this reg form only has a username field, no password. And I'm just going to sign in as the user, no PWS, no passwords, and hit register. And notice that uh, uh, WebAuthn is now prompting me to use either my hardware, uh, Bluetooth, or built-in platform authenticator. Since I'm on a MacBook Pro, I'm going to click that. And then you see that um, it's able to invoke uh, a prompt through my OS. And I can authenticate, or authenticate using my fingerprints on the Touch ID. And just for one more uh, safety sake, it's gonna, Chrome is going to prompt me, am I sure that I want to do this? I'm going to hit Allow. And just like that, I have been uh, enrolled uh, to this app. So Pile. That was awesome. How did that happen? Awesome. So let's switch to the slides again. Oh, it's already there. <laughs> so what, what we're looking at from a demo standpoint, right, there's three components. You have the authenticator, you have your web server, your web application, and then you have the client-side web authentication API. Now, when uh, James registered, he passed the username no passwords, uh, during the registration. What the web server does at this time is after it looks at the username, it then generates a challenge. And when I talk about challenge, again, it's a randomly generated long string uh, that cannot be uh, reproduced, uh, that cannot be basically guessed. And it also sends the username and the relying party information. And this relying party information is about information about the domain of the web server. Then on the web, uh, web authentication side, it receives that. So before that, let's look at the code here, just as an example. So the, on the client side, this is what your code will look like. You're going to first check to see if your client supports web authentication. And if it does, then you're going to call navigator.credentials.create with a public key as a parameter. This public key has all of these information in the, um, in the object. So it has the challenge that is received by the server. Now this, is at the, at, this will be the actual value that has been sent by the server. I just have an example here just to show you how you would kind of randomly generate a challenge here. Then you have the relying party information, which is the information about the web server. You have your user information, which is the username. Attestation. This attesta attestation really means um, the server is requesting the authenticator to prove itself, so prove its integrity. So that's where the attestation piece comes into picture. This is typically kind of used more in the compliance-based environments, 
by default attestation is set to none. And then you have the public key credentials parameters. So these are the signing algorithms. So um, FIDO2 requires the servers to be able to support ES256, RS256, and then RS1 for backward compatibility. And then this authenticator selection, this is pretty key. So when the user is tapping into these devices or touching into the devices, the server is also asking that I want user verification as well and not just the user presence. So I want to be able to have something additional beyond just the tapping. I want the user to either do biometrics or I want them to do uh, enter like a pin depending on the device type. So that's where I'm saying that, hey, I want the user verification is required. So this is what's sent from the server to the client. So we've built a handy little debug tool into our demo so we can actually see some of the data flow between the client and the server. So if I just go ahead on the bottom and expand this debug terminal, we should be able to see some of those messages that uh, Pio alluded to. So as you can see, when I uh, signed into the app, I uh, sent a message to the server wanting to register under the, the username no passwords. And immediately I received the response back from the server. Here was the challenge, the randomly generated string that Pio was referring to that I must now respond back to, uh, as well as the uh, encryption algorithms that I'm going to use. And very important, this is the no phishing part of it. Here's the relying party. So when this credential eventually gets registered, it's going to be registered under this domain name. And then um, here's the user ID that's uh, the server signs that's associated with the username I inputted. So Pyle, maybe uh, if you could walk us yeah. through the rest of the flow here. Yeah, so once the client receives this information, right, then it adds the relying party ID, generates an ID for the origin as well, and sends that information to the authenticator. So uh, along with the challenge username and the relying party, that's sent to the authenticator. This authenticator, like I said, can be your phone, your uh, like a FIDO2 devices, any of the FIDO2 enabled devices, like your laptop as well. And these devices, are uh, capable of storing these credentials, the public-private key credentials that it generates in a very secure manner, either in, their, in the secure element or TPMs or key storage, things like that. So in this case, what the authenticator is going to do is first it's going to check for the origin, then it's going to ask for a user presence and user verification, so either with biometrics or PIN, and then it generates a new public-private key pair. It also generates an attestation object, which is basically information about itself that it needs to send to the server to prove its integrity. And this is where the uh, device would have its own certs along with that, so it'll send some additional information about that. And then the user verification, right? And then what it does, it, it stores the private key, and it, sends, it, it generates a credential ID for this public-private key pair. And then it sends back the new public key the, it also, of course, signs the challenge that was sent from the server with the new private key that was generated. So it sends the signed challenge, it sends the credential ID for that key pair, and it sends the attestation object. On the server side, the server validates the signature with the public key. It validates the value of the challenge to make sure that that has not changed at all. And then it store, and it of course, looks at the attestation object and verifies the authenticity of the authenticator. And it stores the new public key and the credential ID for this user on the server side. So nowhere in the flow are you seeing any sensitive information being passed. The private key and the uh, biometrics or the PIN never really leaves the device, the authenticator that the user has. And the web server never has any credentials for the users that are stored. So that's when the registration is complete, by the way. Yes, yeah, so once again, let's make sure we're seeing those types of messages uh, in our demo here. So I've scrolled down in the logs to the section where we're sending the assertion back to the server for validation, the response to that challenge. So this is the credential ID that uh, has been associated with my platform authenticator, my touch ID. And then uh, this is uh, the uh, attestation object uh, which, uh, which is uh, this long string over here. And uh, this is the client data, which is the signed challenge that the server will now validate to make sure that I'm, I'm responding to the original challenge that was sent. 
And once the server validates that, uh, I get a 200 OK message saying that I have successfully registered. Yeah, and all this information sent back is encoded. That's why you see those strings. Yeah. All right, so let's maybe look at the, uh, the other half of the flow, which is the authentication flow. So I'm going to uh, hide my debug terminal here and go back to my demo. And I'm going to sign in under the same uh, username here, no passwords. And once again, you'll see Chrome through the OS wants to validate my identity. So I will use my fingerprint on the touch ID. And just like that, no typing, uh, I'm logged into my application. Very simple app, just a little bit of relaying back some of the data. So, uh, uh, Pyle, if you could walk us through similarly the authentication flow, that'd be great. Sure. And when, what you saw earlier was, well, let me switch here. So what you saw earlier was when James authenticated this time, the uh, website actually remembers which uh, credential ID was sent back, right? So we'll talk about that as well. So when, when we do the authentication, now again, James sent the username this time. Now this time what the web server does is it knows that this user is already registered. So it again generates a new challenge and it sends the credential ID that is tied to this username. Now, there could be a list of credential IDs that this, the server sends because you can not only register, like, you, you can register multiple devices in this case. So you can register your laptop, you can register your phone, you may have a FIDO2 uh, external device, you can register that too. So it'll send a list of credential IDs, and that would have prompted on James's screen to show, hey, which one do you want to use, right? So it sends the credential ID back as well. So on the code side, as an example, it's going to be very similar to what we saw on the um, registration side, but of course, some differences. So again, you're going to check if your client supports WebAuthn, and if it does, this time you're going to call navigator.credentials.get with public key options. Now, the options here that are sent with public key are you have your challenge that you receive from the server. Again, the value here is just to show you guys how you would generate one, but otherwise it's the value received from the server. And then you have this allowed credentials. This allow credentials is the list of credential IDs. So if you have multiple, it'll basically send the whole list of credentials IDs, IDs back to the client. Great. So once again, let's take a look at our uh, demo log here. Um, so uh, right after our registration was complete, uh, this, this line signals the beginning of our uh, login or authentication flow. So. Uh, once again, I am asking the server, I want to log in under the username no passwords, and I receive a response back to the server with my credential ID, along with the randomly generated string, which is my challenge, and of course, once again, very importantly, the relying party ID, which is the domain that I want to log into. <coughs> so back to you, Pyle. Oh yeah, I talked about, I missed the user verification part. Again, the server is requesting for user verification here as well, that I want something like a biometrics or a pin for the user to verify himself or herself. So then the client then passes all this information along, along with the relying party ID information back to the authenticator. The authenticator this time, again, checks for the origin, asks for user present, asks for the user verification as well, either with biometrics or a PIN. And so when James then taps into the device with his biometrics, the authenticator then also looks for the credential ID um, and, of course, ties, looks up for the private key tied to that credential ID. And it then combines a couple of things and signs that those two information with the private key and sends it back. It's basically, at this point, it's sending an assertion. So just before that, I'll let you show you guys what that is. So what the authenticator does, it takes that client data hash that was received from the client. It's basically hash of the combination of the challenge and the origin information and the credential ID. It combines the authenticator data from the authenticator at this time as well. And if you look at the authenticator data quickly, it's a bunch of fields like the relying party ID hash, it has a bunch of flags like the UV flag, which is user verification equals to UP equals user presence equals true. And then you have the counter, which is basically sent for um, more around replay attacks. And so what it does is it combines the authenticator data and the, the client information that it received from the client 
which is a challenge in the uh, origin and the reliant party ID, and it signs them together with the private key tied to that credential ID that was sent to the authenticator and generates an assertion signature. So that's the difference between registration and authentication. The registration, it sends back an attestation object, and then with, with authentication, it sends an assertion object back. And so all of this information is sent back to the server. On the server side, the server then validates the signature. It validates the value of the challenge. It checks for the user handle, which is the user verification. It also looks at the authenticator data and checks for like replay attacks and things like that. And then once it's verified all of this, it logs the user in. And so this is just a response from the server saying that, OK, all the validations, expectations are true, valid ex uh, expectations are true, and the user's logged in. Yep, so once again, we'll close out kind of this final leg of the authentication flow. So um, uh, this is uh, 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 sending the assertion back to the server. So here again is my credential ID associated with my platform authenticator on this device. And then uh, here was the authentication uh, data that uh, Pio was referring to earlier. Here's the client data hash. And the combination of these two plus my uh, private key signing it creates this signature right here. And once the server validates that, uh, I will get uh, 200 successfully authenticated under my username. So kind of going back here, right? <clears throat> when you look at all the, the security aspect of this, again, just to repeat, the sensitive information, which is your private key, your biometrics, your PIN, never ever leaves the authenticator. There is no sensitive data going across the communication channels anywhere, and the web server is not storing any information. So, it, it, you know, anytime your user is authenticating with this, they cannot get phished at this point because really everything is tied to the origin, and there is no sensitive information that they can steal at all. So these are the browsers that support today. Um, this, is, this is basically you have the Chrome desktop, Chrome, Chrome on Android, Firefox, Edge, and with Edge moving to Chromium, uh, I believe there's support in there as well. Um, and then we Safari, it's in development mode, so it is coming soon. And iOS, we, don't, we still don't have support there, but I've seen some experimental features available as well. So, but there is a lot of uh, momentum around uh, the browsers supporting web authentication today. So to kind of recap this, this session and summarize some of the benefits, uh, web authent is based off of strong authentication. It's based off public key cryptography. And more importantly, uh, it is a standard now by the W3C. Um, in addition, though, um, in addition to being stronger than passwords or some of the uh, two FA factors Pyle alluded to earlier, it also is really simple to use, which means lower friction and ultimately more adoption for your end users. Also, inheriting some of the best benefits of, of, of FIDO1, it is resistant to phishing uh, because, again, each uh, key pair is tied specifically to a domain. And uh, all of this, the combined uh, enhanced security, with the lower user friction, with the resistance to phishing, should result in cost savings for you if you choose to adopt this type of technology. Uh, because we should see less password resets, less provisioning requests. And another side benefit of WebAuthn is because a lot of these biometrics are being built into some of these platform authenticators. And as Pio alluded to earlier, there's a use case where you can use your exister, existing uh, mobile device and pair it via Bluetooth for authentication, uh, it means um, uh, that your consumers or your end users will already have um, this technology in hand, and they don't need to necessarily purchase something additional to be able to leverage this technology. So we think this will have uh, the ability to scale and, and, and be adopted. So what does this all mean? Uh, we kind of teased the session with a question, does this mean the end of passwords? I guess we have to answer that, don't we, Pyle? Yeah, so I'll give my thoughts, but we'll love to get your thoughts, and of course, James, yours too. Mm -hmm. um, 
first impression, I mean, it definitely looks promising, right? Um, I would love to use something like that. But I can see passwords still kind of clinging and hanging around. Um, some, some, some of the websites would want to do something like before you register the, the user and the devices, you may want them to probably authenticate first in some sort of way, right? Like an identity proofing. Uh, it could be where the existing websites keep their passwords to start with and then have the users register and then move them off of that altogether or keep passwords as a backup. Um, you saw this morning we did a demo. Um, you could also do some type of proofing with just a simple magic link so we may not need passwords at all. Uh, so there's a possibility there as well. And then also when it comes to browser support, there is still some work involved. Like with iOS, it's such a widely used device today, we, st we still don't have support in the, uh, on iOS yet, so that has yet to come, but I'm hoping Apple will do some work there. And also when it comes to these types of devices, you know, not all users may have access to these kind of devices that support, so like smartphones or laptops with biometrics, they may be able to get devices outside like an external device like a Yubico um, with PIN or something like that, but then they have to go purchase that. And not everybody would have multiple devices, so if they, you know, they may register one device, they lose it, they have to still fall back on something that would let them in. So there are, there are still ways to go, uh, but definitely looks promising. What do you think, James? Yeah, I think there, there are definitely some good signs, right? Uh, most users are used to the idea of biometrics. Today, it unlocks your keychain, which is your real password and your real credentials. This is a much better and safer way to do things. Uh, but so, to some degree, the user is already kind of familiar with this type of experience. And also, the increasing browser support is a good sign, along with the standardization. But as Pyle said, this is not going to happen overnight, right? Not everyone is going to have uh, especially on, uh, you want to talk about desktop, have a device that has like a built-in biometric or platform authenticator, right? So we will see a continuation of passwords until kind of, you know, the next phase of, 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 of uh, human uh, behavior and um, hardware uh, devices to support it. Uh, but we are also kind of interested in your opinion, if we go to the next slide here. And um, uh, uh, so, Please also share your inputs on whether or not um, you think passwords will be uh, obsoleted by WebAuthn, uh, but also uh, we're also open to any Q&A, and in addition to incentivize uh, all your patience and for all your wonderful questions, we're also passing out uh, FIDO2 USB keys thanks to our sponsor, Yubico. Uh, they have asked if we could scan your badge in exchange for a free key. So um, with that, uh, any questions from the audience? Oh, right a lot of UB key folks. <laughs> uh, yes. And these keys support PIN, by the way. I noticed it's, that's loud. Um, I noticed it said it was resistant to phishing. I was wondering where there's still vulnerabilities. <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I mean, really, it's more around, again, if your device is stolen, right, as an example. And if you don't have user verification and it's just a tap, um, in that case, because like I said, um, you know, it, if the server does not request for user verification and they still go through that and you still set this up as a password list, if your device is stolen, say your spouse or your friend steals it, then they could still authenticate at that point as you. So that's a capability. That's why like, things like attestation, user verification are key to going passwordless here when you do these. And of course, verifying everything on the server side as well so you don't leave, leave those holes out there. Hi. Uh, how do I uh, sign on the same account with two devices? Is there so something? with two devices, so when you went and registered, you can go and like typically, again, our example didn't do that. But typically, the website would also require that like once you're authenticated, you would actually, you should have a list of devices that are available for you. And you can go and add and register additional devices. And it should also like ask you for a PIN if you're registering like a UB, UB key that supports the PIN. So yep. typically, the websites have to build that out. Remember in Pyle's code example, uh, you had the credential ID, which is associated with that specific yeah, credential. Yeah, so at first time, you'll just register one device, and then once you're in, you have uh, the capability of re registering additional devices. Will this tie into the, the, during the keynote, they talked about the user behavioral 
uh, functionality that's coming for the adaptive MFA. Will this tie into that so that if it's a, if for instance, like a lost key, would it see that you're on a new device with the key that you already have and perhaps prompt for additional authentication as a result? Or is there integration that's coming for that? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So our session was meant for kind of just uh, more around the web auth and standard, but your question is specifically related to the Okta product. So first of all, I would say in our security roadmap session, there was a previous one and there's a repeat going to happen at 3.30. Uh, they're going to cover web auth and implement it as part of the Okta sign-in widget, as part of our, our product. Um, and uh, as part of our product, yes, you can do factor sequencing, which means um, based on context, such as IP and device context, you can say, forget the password, go straight to the web auth then as the only factor. And you can add additional factors as needed depending on the risk context of the user. So at the beginning you were talking about phishing uh, TOTP tokens. Uh, do HOTP tokens have the same kinds of issues for phishing? Um, I would think so. I don't see, I don't see what, pardon me? Yeah, everything pretty much goes to the browser. Anything can be captured with the, with, the per, with the attacker sitting in the middle and proxying all the requests. It can just grab that information. The user thinks it's the real site, so they're giving you their real PIN, so, or the real OTP. <laughs> uh, to follow up on the registry multiple devices, so with this approach, how would one access an account from, let's say, a uh, public computer or without having done all the legwork ahead of time to register more devices? Yeah, when it comes to accessing from a public computer, right, um, that's going to be challenging because it's not your device that you're registered with. You don't want to store your credentials on there either. Um, that's where, I mean, if you want to use an external authenticator at that time, that would be a safer approach. So if you are using a phone, um, in that case, you still have to tie it with Bluetooth on your laptop, the public laptop. You may, wanna, you may not wanna, wanna do that. So something like a UB key at that point with a pin is what you insert and log in is the best way to go. So yeah, that kinda counts as a limitation, right? Uh, when it comes to moving to web auth, then you do have limitations like these as well that we need to figure out. Yeah. So, uh we are moving from a centralized authentication to a decentralized, like, device-based. So do you see any hybrid uh, solution required? Um, but like we were talking about, right, when, when we said the passwords may not go away, so there may be a hybrid approach where during the registration, a lot of times you may want to register a device once the user is already known to you, uh, and they've gone through some additional ID proofing, at that point you may see a hybrid approach where you still have a password at that point, but then you know, once they do that, then you move away. And like he was asking the question specific to Okta, depending on the risk context, you know, you may be like, okay, you know what, even though web authentication is highly secured, I want them to go through some additional factors in this case. Um, and password could be one additional factor as an example. So yeah, there could be hybrid approaches in this case. Great questions. Looks like we have time for two more. And we're also looking for your, um, your thoughts as well, not just questions. So let us know what you guys think when it comes to going passwordless. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Hi, so WebAuthn is still a pretty new standard. What sort of developer support and libraries exist currently? So for developers, there are libraries already existing. Um, and there's like a lot of different examples too. But like I said, right, it's, it's basically an extension for Credential Management API. Um, so when, if you kind of just go to GitHub, you'll find a lot of different libraries. And um, there's examples from Google, there's examples from YubiKey, YubiCo. Um, so you will find a lot of different libraries out there today. Are you, um, over here. Are you aware of any uh, existing published vulnerabilities in any of the authentication devices? Um, mainly the one big thing that I've been reading everywhere is the user verification part. Is even though the user verification can be set to uh, basically false or a zero, not required, uh, that's when you shouldn't use the web authentication for 
primary authentication. Um, I haven't come across any of the known vulnerabilities yet. Everything's been very positive so far, and it's very new. But yeah, that, that's something that's yet to be documented so or found. Things like um, uh, weak key generation, um, like remote code execution on the keys themselves. Like it seems like this has got a lot of potential, but with any new technology, there's going to be tons of implementation bugs, and they'll be really severe. Right. Yeah, so of course, it depends on the authenticator devices as well, right? That's where they have to be FIDO2 certified or enabled at that point. So they have to meet the standards before you, you can say that this is a FIDO2 device. All right, well, that wraps up our questions. Uh, we do want to remind everyone, um, if you enjoyed the session, please give us some love. Uh, these survey scores do matter. Um, and uh, also, just a reminder that uh, for those of you guys uh, looking for more information, that roadmap session all the way on the right is going to talk about Octa's implementation of WebAuthn. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we had an overlap with the uh, customer identity roadmap session, which was the same time, time slot as this one. But uh, that will kind of give you more context in general about where we're going with our customer identity product. And also, uh, on Wednesday at 1 p.m., uh, for those of you who are kind of just new to Authors APIs and SDKs, Nate Barbatini, our DevX product manager, will be walking through kind of uh, how Okta uh, makes it easy to add authentication and user management to your applications, as well as share a roadmap for some of these items. Yeah, in the morning session when we showed the ticket code demo, there was a part where the user logs in with the magic link. You can actually replace that with WebAuthn, and that's pretty much a password experience, passwordless experience there as well. All right, thank you. Oh, thank you for coming. <laughs>